It's my distinct pleasure and honor to introduce our afternoon keynote speaker, Representative Michael Capuano. Representative Capuano is serving his ninth term as a member of Congress, where he is the senior Massachusetts member on the Committee on Transportation and Infrastructure, and he also serves on the Financial Services Committee. Prior to running for Congress, Representative Capuano served as mayor of Somerville, Massachusetts, so he has particular resonance for this conference and this audience. With his experience in local and federal government, Representative Capuano is uniquely qualified to discuss the fiscal challenges of leading a city, particularly in regards to infrastructure investment. I also want to just take a moment to say that he is an honorary degree uh, holder from Boston University, and he pulled off one of the great rhetorical feats that I've seen, which was when he had a student audience at commencement who wanted to hear Steven Spielberg. He gave a speech that convinced them that he actually did a better job than Steven Spielberg would have done. <laughs> so welcome, Representative Chavon. Yeah, I tried to get Spielberg to split his paycheck. He wouldn't go for that. Um, I have no idea what I'm going to tell you that you don't already know. I mean, I know a fair number of people in this room, and they know as much as I know about any of this stuff. So I'm going to keep it relatively short and talk about whatever's in your mind, because you guys have been talking about a lot of things. I was listening to some of the healthcare stuff, and it's fun to know that some of the issues don't change. <laughs> um, they only get harder. This is no different. I mean, I guess I'm here to talk about the fiscal aspects of transportation. The bottom line is if you want to build stuff, you need to pay for it. Thank you for coming. <laughs> I don't understand what's so difficult about this. It's, you know, I mean, if you want a first-class transportation system on road or rail or anything you want, somebody has to pay for that. And it's kind of amazing because for reasons that I don't understand, we get a lot of people in Washington who everybody wants all the right thing for transportation. There's no one who doesn't. But they somehow lose that last aspect. And I'll be honest with you, it's been amazing to me to watch former mayors and county commissioners come to Washington as elected officials and all of a sudden forget that. Now, I'd always, I've always been amazed, as a, as, a, as a former mayor, we were required by law to balance the budget. Every mayor in Massachusetts, I presume every mayor in the country, has to balance the budget, and yet we all run for re-election saying, I balance the budget, like it's a big deal. I mean, if you don't do that, you kind of go to jail. So it's hard to get elected from jail, even though we've had a few mayors that did that, uh, not in a long time. And for some reason, we get it. On the local level, you get it. If you want something, you want transportation, you want education, you want good police, you want whatever it is you want, you have to pay for that, either through property taxes or cutting something else. It was always the easiest thing in the world when I had anybody come into my office, just I slid the budget across the table. Here's the budget. What do you want me to cut? I'm, you've got a great idea. Never heard a bad idea for spending more money. What do you want me to cut? And if not, will you help me raise taxes? And I do the same thing on the federal level, and they kind of look at you like you have two heads. And to be honest with you, when it came to the transportation bill, we're working on a highway bill now. Other than money, everybody agrees. Oh, we have to build all kinds of things, and America's infrastructure is falling apart, et cetera, et cetera. But when then you get to the hop, I go, oh, no, no, we, we can't raise revenues. No gas tax, no income tax, no tax on oil, no tax on anything. Um, but we will talk about an infrastructure bank. Infrastructure bank? Last I knew, when you borrowed money out of a bank, you had to pay it back, and usually with interest. So how does that help us in the long run to simply borrow for today's needs and not worry about tomorrow's? Massachusetts did that, not with a technical infrastructure bank, but we did it with the big dig. We borrowed money at the end of that project from future federal funds. That's how we, the agreement they made with the Federal Highway Administration at the time. No more federal money, but you can borrow from future funds. They just finished paying it off. We have another project going on right now, the Accelerated Bridge Program. It was, a lot of it was funded with some of the stimulus money, but the stimulus money didn't go far enough, and we had a lot of bridges falling down, like every state has. And how do we pay for that? We're paying for that with future federal funds. Right now, approximately 20% of every federal dollar that comes into Massachusetts for transportation is used to pay for projects that have already been done which means we have less money to pay for the projects we need to do now. In an infrastructure bank, it's okay for some projects, especially larger ones, but it reduces the amount of money you have in the future to pay for projects you will need in the future. 
Now, if you can guarantee me that all the roads and all the bridges you do now will never have to be redone, or there'll be no additional projects necessary in your cities and towns 10 years from now, we can have the greatest infrastructure bank in the world. But I've been in politics now for over 30 years, and guess what? There are still bridges that need to be fixed. And it will happen again 30 years from now. And again, I just don't think, I'm not in this, and I hope most people aren't in this, just for today's needs. That doesn't solve the problem. The other thing that's been thrown out there is, oh, public-private partnerships. Great, not opposed to those. There are some things that work that way. But when you get the word private involved, you're also missing another P word, and that's called profit. Private companies need to make profit, and there's nothing wrong with that. But when you add that aspect into it, how does it work? The first major project that was done in this country was the selling of the Indiana Toll Road. To this date, I have not got simple numbers. Simple numbers like how many dollars did you collect in tolls before you sold the road? How many do you collect today? Because if it was such a great deal that the private company that bought it was going to make a ton of money, why would you sell it? Government wants to make money on some things so they can spend it on others. And if it was such a bad deal, which apparently it turns out to be, why would any private company buy it? It doesn't mean it doesn't work. We're discussing that in Massachusetts right now, a public-private partnership to put a third or fourth lane on uh, Route 3, going down to the Cape. Well, that's all well and good, but then there's another question that no one wants to ask. What do you want in your highway system? I personally think that a highway system should be accessible to everyone. It benefits the entire society to have a good highway system. Why? Because I wear clothes, I eat food, and all of that comes to me through trucks. I want to go to New York, I want to go to Rhode Island, I have to drive on a road. It's a public benefit to that. I think it should be a public issue. If you have an, a lane that can only by, be used by people who pay for it, you now have a bifurcated society. What's the income level where people can afford to pay for that fast lane? And what about the rest of us who can't? We get allocated to the slow lanes? So my time, not just mine, Mine and my 10,000 people, the time value of me waiting in traffic is not as important as this one guy who, by the way, I work for. Now, if you think that's a great idea, fine, but then the most of America will be stuck in even worse traffic than they're stuck in now. And the wealthy will be speeding along in very little used lanes. Fair question. If that's what you think, that's a good society, fine, but I think we need to have those discussions. Bottom line is if you want a good transportation system, as always, nothing new, no surprises, we need to pay for it. Yes, we need to be efficient, but the stimulus is a classic example. We get all kinds of grief for the stimulus, we split it up a thousand ways to Sunday, and the only money that was used in the stimulus that we ever get any credit for is money used on infrastructure, roads, bridges, buildings. And then, in the brilliant way that we do things, we get the heck beat out of us for passing the stimulus, and when it comes time to actually cut some ribbons, we call it a different law. We call it, I can't remember, I can't remember what we called it, Reinvestment Act or something. I had asked, what the hell is a Reinvestment Act? What's ARA? And the governor whispered to me, well, that's the stimulus. I said, so? Nobody in this audience knows that it was the stimulus that I got my head handed to me on. Oh, I'm against the stimulus. It's a terrible thing for government to do. Yet everybody was at that ribbon cutting, taking credit for everything. My argument, for those of you in public life, for those of you influencing public life, be straightforward people. They love infrastructure. They don't love sewers. They don't love water pipes because they can't see them. Those are the hardest things to fund. Those are the hardest things to finance. But they love nice, clean, straight streets. They love transit systems. And for those of you from the greater Boston area, I don't know where you're all from. You know what I'm talking about with the T this past winter. Everybody loves the T system that works. Everybody hates one that doesn't. And I think rightfully so. So with all that, unless you can show me how we can build something for free, all the rest is just talk. And I will tell you honestly, 
it amazes me the people that advocate for these things then refuse to advocate for the money to pay for it. When we were doing the last highway transmit, the last, the two-year bill that we did, we get inundated every day with somebody who wants, you know, you've got to have a highway bill. It's like, well, I'm in. But where are you on the other side? Well, you know, some, I can't talk to the, my congressman because they don't really like that stuff. I said, so what are you coming to see me for? You don't live in my district. You can't vote for me. I don't care how much money you donate to me, which you're not going to anyway, because the only thing you want is federal money in your pocket to build a road. Then you want a tax cut. I'm sorry. It doesn't work that way. And I think America has to wake up and grow up a little bit. And I think those of us in public life have an obligation to help with that. Otherwise, we will continue on the road that we're on now, which is a very bumpy and very pothole fill road. And we're about to do it again. We have the highway bill coming up, I don't know, May, the end of May, I think it is. And there's still no talk about revenues. Yet every day I get somebody coming in, we have to have transportation, we have to have roads. Well, fine. I have to have a gas tax or something to replace it. Not because I like taxing people, but because you have to pay for it. So when you ask for these things, please remember, and you all know this, there's another side to the equation. Spending is easy. Raising the money to do it is not. And we do not have enough money. We do not have the political will in this country at this point in time to actually build the infrastructure. And might fix what we have. We never would have built what we had now if this mindset were in place for the last 50 years. It's only something new. And now we're fighting an even newer argument coming out of the extreme right wing called devolution. Devolution is what's the federal government have to do with highways or transit systems? They should be out of it altogether. It should be done completely by the state and local government. Well, that'd be great. Because that Amtrak line that comes on, we don't need the same width gauges. The train doesn't really need to actually go from one state to another. It could stop, you could get off and get onto another train in another state. It's ridiculous. Either we are one country or we are not. And the concept of devolution is ridiculous. It presumes the federal government has paid for all transportation, which of course is false. We're down to roughly 50-50 on a project that gets any federal money. It used to be 80-20, it's now 50-50. But I have to be honest, I do respect those who advocate for devolution because you know, they're short-sighted and they admit they're short-sighted and they're happy to be short-sighted. So my answer is go stand in the corner and enjoy your view of the world. But for the rest of us, the hard part is being honest with people. And it doesn't make anyone happy. But I'll be honest with you, when we put those signs up that say, brought to you by your tax dollars, people understand it, people appreciate it, and when it comes to infrastructure, they can feel it and they can touch it. Now, that doesn't mean I'm not an anti-infrastructure guy, but those things are harder to argue. Infrastructure is the easiest thing in the world to argue, and I think, it's, uh, I think the average American person would appreciate having to pay for it. And from the way I look at it, if they don't want to do it, now I come from, I'm an old politician, guys, I'm sorry. I tried to get the president to do this, he wouldn't do it. It would have been very simple. If your congressman voted against the stimulus, you don't get any. Kind of simple. I voted for it. Instead of getting one bridge, I should have gotten two. But I had to share it with somebody who didn't vote for it. Now, in my world, my argument is if you have the courage of your convictions, you should live with the consequences of those convictions. And in this case, it would be very, very, very bad roads. But if that's what you want for your constituents, and that's what they, oh, I have no, we have low taxes. Good for you. You also have terrible roads. <laughs> I want good roads. I'm willing to pay for it. My constituents are willing to pay for it. And I think we need to stand up and say that. So I think everyone here already knew everything I just said, except I get the microphone, so I get a chance to say it. Uh, and with that, I'm going to stop, because I, I wish there was some secret formula I had, um, but there isn't. Uh, it's nothing new. It's the same old story, except I need more people with courage to stand up and say these things. I think that gives you some feel for why he was so great at commencement. But uh, <laughs> I'm going to slip in one question. Then I'm going to let you call on people, if that's all right with you. I mean, I don't know sure. the names either, so just By the way, I hate them. being behind you, but I see the camera. I'd rather be out there, but that's all right. So I apologize for being this far away. So the question that I'm going to slip in is, is it true that things have got worse? The old saying used to be, 
that the one thing Congress could always pass was a highways bill, and then we've been through a period where they couldn't pass a highways bill. So have yeah. things got worse, and if so, why? They have gotten worse um, for two reasons. I, I just saw a TV ad just this morning, as a matter of fact, for an automobile. And I was half listening, you know, getting ready to go to work and all that kind of thing. And the ad starts out with, compromise is a terrible thing. That's why you need to buy my car, because it's uncompromising. It's like, I hear that every day in Washington. Compromise is a terrible thing. I know what's right. I am not compromising. What are you doing here? Go home. Every day of my life, I have compromised. I've been married for 41 years. <laughs> no, that's for my wife. She's the one who deserves the appreciation, not me. Every day is a compromise. I was a strong mayor in a city government, and people who are local know I wasn't the nicest guy in the world to be mayor. I fought with everybody. But we got things done. So for me, yes, there's nothing wrong with being strong, Will. But right now, in Washington, for reasons that I can't understand and I cannot explain, America has decided to send us a critical mass, not a majority, but a critical mass of people in Congress who are elected who ran on the platform the promise of not compromising. And that is exactly what they're doing. I don't understand how government works that way. Any government. I, didn't, I had a compromise as mayor, compromise on my personal life. I want a compromise in Congress. And I'll tell you it's a compromise. It's not what I want. It's what I got. Everything, everything I've ever done has been the result of a compromise even when I didn't have to deal with the city council. So what? But until that changes, until Congress changes enough, and by the way, I don't blame the members of Congress. If I run and say I'm not going to compromise and I get elected and I don't, that's not my fault. That's the people who elected me. I run for Congress and say I'm going to compromise. Here are the things I believe in, but yes, I'll compromise. Healthcare, you just had a big panel on healthcare. Nobody in their right mind left alone would have written the ACA. That's not how it gets done. It's a mess. We have 435 members of the House, 100 members of the Senate, and the President, and we all have something to say, and we all have to get a little piece of the pie and push and shove. It is no different than any state legislator. It is no different than any city hall. It is no different than your personal life, except we have a lot more people doing it. So you always end up with a messy bill. What's wrong with that? It works pretty well for 250 years, and right now it's not because we have too many people who won't compromise. Once they finally either move off to the side or, in my opinion, more importantly, the people who are willing to compromise are willing to turn to those who are not and say, you're done. You, I can't unelect you, but I'm no longer going to let you drive the train. And I said earlier, and I meant it, it is not a majority of the House. It is not a majority of any one party. It is a small minority, about 50 people, depending on how you count, but those 50 people have the majority party scared to death because of primaries. They're scared of getting a primary from the right. And my argument is, well, no one wants a primary. I get that. A politician, I want to get reelected, but not at all costs. At some cost, yes, but at all costs, no. And yes, it's worse until that changes it's going to continue to be worse, and that's the highway bill is a classic example. Uh, there is, right now, there's no hope of it. I'll give you an example. A year, a little over a year ago, about a year and a half ago now, you have to understand, I'm very, very proud of my, up until last two years, my zero rating from the United States Chamber of Commerce. <laughs> now, not the local Chamber of Commerce, they're fine, but the U.S. Chamber of Commerce and I never saw eye to eye on pretty much anything until about two years ago. And then the head of the U.S. Chamber of Commerce, uh, Tom Donahue, who's been there for 20, 30 years, ultimate professional, well-respected, thoughtful guy, came before the Transportation Committee and publicly advocated for an increase in the gas tax. He said, the U.S. Chamber of Commerce has come to the conclusion we need to do something. We therefore favor the increase of a gas tax. Now, the Chamber of Commerce never increased, favored an increase in taxes on anything that I've ever known of, but here they did. And of course, my question to him was, well, you know, I agree with you on that. I agree with you on immigration. I agree with you on certain tax policies. I said, is my zero rating in trouble? His response was, don't worry, Congressman Capuano. To us, you will always be a zero, you know, which I appreciate. It helps me here. 
But the very next day, the very next day, the former chairman of that committee from Florida publicly called for Tom Donahue to be fired. Not, and, and anybody who knows any of these, I'm sure that every, every one of you belongs to some association of some kind. Nobody in charge of one of those associations would say such a thing without having vetted it with his board first. Of course he did. And you can disagree with, you could say, I publicly disagree with him, but to call for him to be fired, I, I, that, sh that told me an awful lot. That told me that there's no chance in hell we're gonna get revenues to increase for transportation in the foreseeable future. And that being the case, uh, it won't change until the people change. Yeah, ma'am. Congressman, great, great uh, remark. Do you think there's any chance of getting a uh, redistricting down at the congressional level uh, so that we can you know, get a more balanced Congress? <laughs> I don't want a balanced Congress. I want an imbalanced Congress in my favor. <laughs> Um, again, I, I tell you, I'm, a, I'm an old Paul. I, I have never seen a redistricting process that is perfect. You always have human beings. They're always imperfect. They always bring their own prejudices to the table. So my argument is, you know what? As an old Democrat, it used to work to our favor. And we said, oh, you know what? That's a nasty process. Ooh, politics. I don't like it. That's, we should get somebody who's much smarter than us to do it. It hasn't worked out. Why? Because even the smartest people in the world, which is apparently all of you, you come your own prejudices. Oh no, we can't cut the district this way. We have to cut it that way. And it's kind of, it, it, I haven't lost on the fact that in the last several elections, Democrats have actually won more votes than Republicans in the House and the Senate, yet we lose seats because we have refused to play, to play by the rules of the game as they exist today. If you want to change the rules, we should change them. But for me, I'll be honest, I'm not about perfection. I'm not about ivory tower. I'm about street level success. I need more people that share my values and pretty much whatever it takes to get them, I will do, including redistrict them if I have the chance. And I think Democrats should remember that we got there through politics and the best way to stay there is through politics. That gets me in trouble with every reformer I know, so I'm going to hear about this. It's on tape now. <laughs> hey, Elizabeth. Oh, okay, over there. I, oh, I don't know if you get to ask a question, Kim. <laughs> oh, I'd bar, I bow to the mayor first. Um, uh, thank you, Congressman. And as a former Somerville resident, I'd like to say for the record, uh, you were always a pussycat, so thank you very much. <laughs> thank you. Yeah. Um, so you, so we know that you don't like uh, infrastructure banks. Uh, could you tell us a little bit what you would like to see for funding sources? Obviously, the gas tax seems to be one that you would be in favor of. Do you have some others that you think would be good sources of revenue to fund infrastructure? And do you have any idea of what levels you'd like to see? Um, I will take any source of revenue I can get. I mean, personally, in my own opinion, the gas tax is kind of obsolete. And it's becoming more obsolete by the day. I mean, I, 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 I'm an environmentalist too. I want to get more miles per gallon, and you know, I want to get to electric cars and all those other things, which means gas tax is going to go through the floor no matter what you raise it to. Number one. Number two, as I, as I said earlier, I believe transportation is a public benefit, so therefore the general public should pay for it. Gas tax makes it almost uh, a user fee, almost. Uh, but at the same time, I'm realistic to know that I'll grab whatever I can grab as long as it goes into the highway trust fund. Um, and, and I think that's the protection for this. If we can get into the trust fund, we, we, people can be honestly looked at and said, yeah, we raise your taxes, but it's, you're getting it back. And here it is in a new green line, here it is in a new um, you know, bridge, whatever it's going to be. Um, so for me, that's why. I, I will tell you that the first meeting I had with the Democrats and the Transportation Committee, uh, they were talking about a nickel in the gas tax, which and I was the junior guy, so the chairman, or not, we were the minority, the ranking member at the time went around the room and said, can you do this? And he, you know, do you support it? What is it? And he got to me, I said, no, I don't. He said, well, what do you mean? You come from a safe district, it's Massachusetts, you're not an anti-tax guy. I said, I'm gonna get just as much political grief for a nickel as I am for a quarter. And a nickel's not gonna go very far. So I'm not for a nickel, I'm for a quarter. I really am serious about building our infrastructure in a good way. Uh, that helped me a lot. I got a lot more money in Amox. Uh, and by the way, I like Amox. And for those of you who don't, 
Uh, I didn't like them when I was mayor because what that meant is the city council got to say where the money went, not me. Now that I'm in the legislative branch, I like them because without that, it goes to the executive branch. What do you think God Almighty himself decides where these projects are? They're done by bureaucrats. Now, there's nothing wrong with that. When I was mayor, I appointed those bureaucrats. So we cooperated on how the decisions got made. But earmarks guarantee that each district gets some of it, as long as they're public and transparent, and you're told. Uh, I'll tell you right now, step outside this building. Take a look at ComAv. For those of you who remember what ComAv was before, actually, you can still see it at the other end. Go past the bridge. That's what it looked like before. Take a look at this end. That's an earmark that I'm happy and proud that I got to get ComAv done. That's just one. So for me, I'll take any revenues I can get as long as it goes in the trust fund so we can guarantee it comes out the right way. Get Kim. Once a mayor, always a mayor. So always, Kim. Always. Kim's a mayor up in Salem. <laughs> I love how you beat around the bush about topics, and we really have to guess where you're at. So that's my favorite part. Um, question for you if you think the notion of social impact bonds might have any play in this Congress. I know you're familiar with ROCA, which really isn't a bond, but the idea of paying for things now that might avoid costs later. I think um, Washington State's had some success with this with things like early ed, um, and it, it felt like it may be one of those bipartisan initiatives that might might actually actually have some support with even the most conservative folks if they can realize savings, and even some of the Wall Street firms have kind of bought into that, and I'm wondering if there's room for that. I was going to ask you about earmarks, if that would incentivize compromise, but uh, I think we know how you feel on that front, too. So and how they get played. I mean, earmarks, if they're played properly, it does, I mean, now you, if you're asking me to vote for a transportation bill, if it's not big enough, my answer is, why would I vote for transportation? I don't know where the money's going. I now have to go back and fight with my governor or whoever it's going to be. And by the way, it doesn't go to the local governments, and I love my local mayors, but you all take credit for federal money, as does the state, but that's okay. I, I get invited to all the ribbon cuttings, too. I don't mind sharing. Um, so earmarks would help. They wouldn't guarantee anything. We still need revenue no matter what, as far as I'm concerned. Um, as far as the, the, the social bonds go, the answer is yes, but it depends. Here, here's part of the problem. You know, that hasn't moved that far that I know of, but the concept is fine, and you'll get some conservative people in favor of the concept, but they will, they, they usually, I won't say they will because it's too early to tell, my, my suspicion would be that they would simultaneously come in and say, and since we can do this, we now have to cut further in these other programs. And that's kind of been their mantra from day one. They'll do one good thing on this hand and then two bad things on this hand. Um, so that's part of the problem. The answer is yes, you, can get, you might be able to get some traction on it, uh, but beware what it is associated with. Yeah, Con. Thank you. Um, we're clearly into the 16 race. And, um, I'm not running. <laughs> for president. <laughs> I wish you were. Um, yeah, well. And uh, your truth telling uh, reminds me of a, a, a candidate long ago, Walter Mondale. He who, lost. <laughs> yes, right, exactly. <laughs> and, that's, and that's my question. Uh, would you advise the standard bearer of your party to be as candid as you have been here today? Hell no. And can the, <laughs> can the American people stand it? No, uh, no, 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 no. <laughs> I wish they could, I wish they would, but no, absolutely not. I, like I said, I want to win. Um, I, I advise them to be candid about as much as they can be. I think that's what the American people want. Um, I've always, again, I'm not running for president, so I don't have to worry about it, but I've always found people, I'd ra I would rather have people angry with me right this very minute about an issue that they know they don't agree with me on than think they walk out of here thinking, well, I think I agree with them, and then six months later realize, that SOB, he didn't agree with me, he must have lied to me. Um, on a national level, there's just so many interest groups, and the media is just sitting there all day long waiting to beat up politicians, and that's worse than it's ever been. Um, I don't know that it's, I don't know how to change it, but it's true. So, no, I wouldn't, I wouldn't advise our national standard bearer to be as uh, forthcoming as I try to be. I would actually encourage them to, whenever you see me doing something, probably best to do the opposite. <laughs> I don't think I could get very many votes and, you know, Alabama, I, I don't know. But then again, I don't want any votes in Alabama, so what's the difference? <laughs> Anything else? Oh, hi. 
Hi, uh, very inspiring talk. Uh, if I think about Somerville, I think about the innovation you did uh, more than maybe 20 years ago about the first internet access, high-speed internet. I'm very curious good. about an update, because I haven't heard as much about that, and what other cities and towns, we heard Paul Soglin earlier today complaining about how it's holding back his city in Madison. Uh, so what are your thoughts on the future, and what has been the success more recently for Somerville? Um, I, I'm a little bit out of it now because I've been doing this for a while, so I can't answer that question directly. Uh, but for us, we jumped into it with two feet right away. Because, but then again, we're a very densely, we're the most densely populated city in New England and like the eighth most densely populated city in America. So it was one thing for us to do it. And at the time, we were a relatively poor city. We're not that anymore. Um, and the idea was to allow people with less income an opportunity to experience and, and succeed on their own. And it worked. Um, I, I, I think it's a, it's a great item to do. I think it is an, a great equalizer. Uh, to have access to as much knowledge as possible. I think that's the best way to do it. Um, so that the cities that are doing it, I think they see a benefit very quickly. Uh, but again, technology has now kind of jumped over all kinds of things. And you know, I, don't, I don't really understand all the clouds and all that kind of stuff yet. Uh, somebody else does. But I think the concept is still 100% right. Uh, but I don't want to see it done only in cities of wealth. It has to be done across the board. Uh, knowledge should have no income level. And I guess I'm being told that I've got to go. That for me, I gotta go. <laughs> Thank you.